It's crucial to take into account the structure of your data when you're choosing a test. For example, if your data has a paired structure, your values come in pairs, it would be inappropriate to run a test that ignored the fact that your values came in pairs. Suppose that what we're interested in is the number of A's a student earns in the fall semester and the spring semester right, of a particular year. Right? And perhaps what we're interested in is whether as the year goes on, the student's grades improve, something like that. Okay? It would be inappropriate to take the number of A's earned by everybody in the fall semester and compare it to the number of A's earned by everybody in the spring semester without taking into account which student is which. Because of course some students are just going to earn fewer A's all the time and some students are going to earn more A's all the time even if it's true that there's a certain trend from fall to spring. Let's try to see that in a table. Suppose that we have four students and we have the fall and we have the spring. And again, what we're interested in is the number of A's these students earn in their classes in fall and spring. So here's a student who got zero A's in the fall and one A in the spring. And here's a student who got uh, three A's in the fall and four A's in the spring. You can see that these are two different types of students. And so it's important to take into account which student is which since we have that information. We may as well use all the information we have. Here's a student who got two A's in the fall and one in the spring. And here's a student who got uh, two in the fall and four in the spring. Okay, there are our students. Okay, so what are we going to do? How are we going to assess the null hypothesis that for each student there is no difference between fall and spring? Because that's our null hypothesis. There's no difference for anyone, at least for a non-parametric test. When we think about randomization tests, we think about all the different ways units could have been allocated to, say, treatment versus control. In this context, clearly we didn't do a randomized experiment. We didn't assign certain classes to be in the fall and certain classes to be the spring. And for the registrar, maybe we did. But that's not what happened here. A student took some classes in the fall and took some classes in the spring. So rather, we're going to think about a permutation test, which of course follows exactly the same steps. What we're going to do is we're going to look at all possible ways fall and spring could have been mixed up for these students. But we're going to maintain, we're going to maintain which student was which. So under the null hypothesis that fall versus spring doesn't matter, another possible data set might have looked like this. Maybe For this student, these two numbers stay the same, but for this next student, we reverse them. And for this student here, the numbers stay the same, and for this next student, we reverse them. Yeah, that was reversing. Okay. These two data sets would be equally likely if we're assuming that fall and spring A's are equally likely. If we're assuming the average grades are the same for these students in the fall and the spring, then this data set where I flipped a couple of these rows is equally likely to this data set. And another possibility would look like this. Maybe this time I'll flip this one. Maybe this time I'll leave that like that. And then I went like this. Right? There's yet another data set where I've maintained which values were in which rows. But under the assumption that the columns are interchangeable, I flipped some of the columns. The permutation test for pairs looks at all the different possible ways I could flip around these rows. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the value of a particular test statistic that I actually observe here to the values of the test statistic that I would observe under other data sets that are possible under the null hypothesis. So what when I, might I do here? Well, what I might do is take the difference between fall and spring for each student that I actually observe. So here. Let's do difference between spring minus fall. So I've got a 1 minus 0 is 1, and a 4 minus, minus 3 is 1, and a 1 minus 2 is negative 1, and a 4 minus 2 is 2. Okay. And I want to take the average of these numbers. So I've got 1 plus 1 is 2, minus 1 is 1, plus 2 is 3. I've got 3 fourths as my average. Okay. What if I took a difference here? I've got 1 minus 0 is 1, 3 minus 4 is negative 1, 1 minus 2, negative 1, 2 minus 4, negative 2. And if I sum these up, I've got a total of negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3. 
divided by 4. And if I do the same thing over here, I've got 0 minus 1 is negative 1, 3 minus 4, negative 1, negative 1, and 2. Okay, and so I've got negative 1 out of 4 as my average. And so a permutation test in this context for this particular test statistic of a difference in means would consist of coming up with a histogram. I'm just going to sketch it here. There's a histogram for you. Of all the different possible values of this test statistic under different permutations that are possible given the null hypothesis that the fall and spring are interchangeable, and then I'll find the value I actually observed, maybe it's there, and figure out the probability that I'd see a value at least that extreme when the null is true. This exactly follows the format of the randomization or permutation test that we talked about when we didn't have paired data. The only thing that's changed is the permutations that we're willing to look at are the ones that maintain the rows that maintain the rows. We're not just going to mix up all the values between the two groups. We're only going to look at um, possible ways to flip the fall and spring for particular students. So that's the general format. We can look at all possible permutations that make sense for pairs and calculate a particular test statistic for each permutation and compare the actual value of the test statistic that we observed to the other test statistics that we could have observed under the null hypothesis. There are many different possible choices for the test statistic. The one I've used here is just a difference in means. And so the test that I'm describing here is just a permutation test for pairs with a difference in means as a test statistic. There's no fancy name for it. However, there are certain test statistics that do have fancy names. And the one I'm going to describe to you is actually one of the simplest. I'm going to describe to you the sign test. Now it turns out that the sign test is not one that's shown in a lot of real studies. It would be a waste of money to go out there, collect a lot of data, do a very rigorous study, and then end it just with a sign test to figure out whether your, your two groups are the same. That would not be appropriate because a sign test is way too simple. We think of it as a back of the envelope test. That said, I'm, I have two reasons for describing it to you now. One is that I have literally done it on the back of envelopes when I'm trying to analyze my data. It's so simple that you can literally do it on the back of an envelope, and that is really helpful when you're trying to quickly get a general sense of the pattern that you're seeing, even if you're not going to put that in your final report or paper. The other reason that I think it's useful for us to discuss here is that it's a really simple, uh, simply structured example of a hypothesis test where you start with your null, you think of all possible randomizations or permutations, you look at how your test statistic varies across those randomization or permutations, and you see how the observed value of the test statistic compares to its reference distribution.